Welcome to Barbell Logic Rewind. This is Barbell Logic. I'm Scott. I got Matt with me. And today we're going to talk about how do you know if linear progression is coming to an end? How do you know when the end is nigh? Yep. So some of this we want to talk about. The reason you think you're done with linear progression is because you're missing reps, right? The idea is linear progression is I can add weight every session. And if I can't add weight every session because I'm missing reps. Well, that's if you're an honest person. A lot of people are like, oh, it's hard. It's over. Sure. It's over. Yeah. How many people do we have signed up for online coaching? They literally mean linear progression for the last two and a half years. (laughs) You're right. A lot. I mean, 40%. 40% probably. Yeah. Yeah, I'd say just under half. Two years. And you go, no, you actually haven't been running for the last two and a half years. You've been screwing around in the gym. You did linear progression half-assed for six weeks. You took off for a month. You did it again. You restarted over and over. Every time it got hard, you reset. You did something else. Yeah. You screwed around with strong lifts. You did five, three, one, three times in there when you weren't even close to being ready for it. That's what they mean. Yeah. So are you resting enough between sets? So in the beginning, how long do you need to rest between sets? Three to five minutes. Yeah, not, not that long. Three in the beginning. It's just exactly 180 seconds. Yeah, it's totally fine. And then as the novice progression progresses and it gets heavier and heavier and the first set becomes a grind and you know the second and third set are going to be grinds, how long do you need to rest? No more than five, really. No more than five? No No less than five. No, once it becomes a grind. Once it becomes a grind? I don't know. Five's plenty. For what? See, I would say longer for squat and deadlift. So let's say you squat 365 for a set of five. Right. And it's a grind on the first set. Well, if you're 365... Okay, so it's we're, weight we're, dependent. We're, we're running towards the end. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we, we might go eight minutes, nine minutes. Okay. So, like yeah. Right. So, the idea here is that obviously, not only are we linear progressing our intensity on our weights, we're probably linear progressing or titrating up the rest periods on our work sets. Would that be fair? Yeah. I tell people that we're resting not to get our heart rate down, though. Sure. I mean, you know, we don't want to get back under the bar if our heart rate's still 205. Right. But it's not, you know, we're not waiting for it to go back down to 65 beats a minute, though. We're trying to get the lactate out of our muscles, gather ourselves mentally again. Yeah. And sometimes that takes eight minutes, 10 minutes. Yeah. And so really, really heavy. Remember, if you're hitting your weights, your rest is enough. The problem is when you start to miss, then you have to go. And I get this all the time, too, with clients where they say, well, you know, I went five reps, five reps, four reps. I feel like I wasn't quite ready to do the third set. I probably should have waited an extra minute or two. And you go, yeah, you should have waited an extra minute or two. Right. The workouts in linear progression should not take two hours, though. No. Really, at, at any point, 90 minutes should be enough to run three exercises yeah. when you're not that strong yet. And so, and if you rest in more than 10 minutes, you probably got to warm up again. Yeah, if I rest more than 10 minutes, I'm cold. Yeah. Right? And, and also, I think the rest needs to be longer for lower body than upper body. So on a super heavy deadlift, if I've got a couple sets of grinders, which if I'm in linear progression, I, I probably don't, unless I'm a female doing two sets of three, then I, I may need to rest. 10 minutes between deadlifts. But for bench press, if I rest 10 minutes on a bench press set, like even if I'm doing 385 and 405, I feel cold. And by the way, I've torn both my pecs. And so cold pecs are not what I want to bench with. So I need to make sure the rest is adequate between sets. It can't be too little. It can't be too much. You'll know if it's too much. You go to the barn, you'll feel cold and you'll feel stiff, right? Feel super heavy on your back. And you just don't know if you can do it when you're cold. The second question is like such a duh sort of question, but if you think you're at the end of linear progression is, are my weight jumps too high? We get a reputation for being, it's five pound weight jumps on the lifts for as long as possible. Wrong. It's any weight jump, right? So what we do is in the beginning, if you're a male, you may jump 10 or even 15 pounds the first several workouts on squats and deadlifts. And then it goes to five pounds and we run five pound jumps as long as we can. And then when we can't do five pound jumps anymore, we go to two and a half pound jumps, which means you have to have 1.25 pound weights as a male. It's going to get there much faster on the upper body lifts. On the upper body lifts, it's going to start with, it probably is going to start at five pound jumps. You might get a 10 pound jump the first couple workouts. First press. Yeah. Maybe. Uh, And bench. And then it'll go to five pound jumps for as long as possible, which will be not as long as squat and deadlift. And then it will move to 2.5 pound jumps. So a guy of normal height, weight, stature, 30 years old, He's going to go to two and a half pound jumps where? On the press. 155, 145? On the press? 30? What, what do you say? Man, you know, the ones I get, I don't know. Yeah, 130 would be, would be right. pretty good. Yeah. 30 though, 30 years old? Yeah. Pretty young. 130, okay. 135, yeah. I, I see that most guys that slow down in that 135 to 155 range, and most guys in their linear progression on the press at 175, 175 180. Yeah. yeah. 
you know, I've got a couple guys on it right now that are like at 207. Yeah. They're still hitting 207.5. So that's a really good pre- I'm t- That's yeah. for three sets of five. Mm-hmm. Remember, I got another guy that's doing it right in that same ballpark, 205 for five sets of three, which is a solid place to go. So, yeah, are you making small enough jumps? The question is, how big a jumps do you make? What if you're a female? How, what kind of weights do you need? Well, you need half pound plates, probably. Yeah. You've got to have a set of fractional plates. Yeah. You know, people have a hard time finding those things. I'll put some links in the show notes. There's a company called Iron Woody that makes a good, yep. that makes a low cost set. Yep. There's a gentleman who owns a machine shop who sells them uh, just through like PayPal. Yeah. Is, and they're actually, they're probably the best ones. They're actually they're, really nice. They're really nice. Yep. They're steel. I've the got an uh, stamped on adder set, adder, A-D-E-R. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can get those from Amazon on, on, actually on Amazon Prime. And of course, Rogue probably makes the coolest set yeah. but they're also the most expensive on rogue it's and now rogue is not typically the most expensive on stuff but some of it is just shipping on those things those so are, the rogue ones are like ten dollars a pound or something yeah they're nice know, though they're, they're fun hey 2020 matt here and at the time of this recording we didn't know about micro gains we love rogue fitness it's one of the best fitness equipment companies in the world but we would absolutely recommend micro gains for micro plates for those fractional plates it's micro G-A-I-N-Z dot com. They're high quality, come in a variety of sizes. They're made in America, competitively priced. If you use discount code LOGIC, you'll get a discount off of the fractional plates there as well. So go to Microgains to get your fractional plates. Yeah. yeah, so, you know, if you're a gym owner, maybe get the Rogues. And if you train not at your house, if you train at a gym, at a powerlifting gym, at a Globo gym, at a CrossFit gym, you're going to need to put those in your gym bag. Yeah, carry them with you. Yeah, and so females are going to have to make jumps in the one pound, one to two pound range on the upper body lifts, what, seven, eight weeks in? Yeah, yeah. Somewhere in there. And of course, that depends on age. Yeah, carry your micro plates to the gym. And if somebody gives you the side eye or the stink eye, just ignore it because yeah. you're right and they're wrong. Yeah, right. You're probably going to get less stink eye about the fractional plates on the bar than you are on the bent over low bar squat. We get more, especially right. if you're a female, right? Like we get this all the time. Hey, should let me show you how to do that. That's right. We're going to mansplain how to, <laughs> hey, listen, here's how you squat. Listen, you don't want to go that low. You're going to hurt your knees and you don't want to bend over that much. You're going to hurt your back. But what's funny is how rare our guys have women come up to them and tell them that. You know how often that happens? Never. Unless Nikki Sims is there. Right. <laughs> She's like, look, but, you need to do this. Well, you need to bend over. But, if for our females who are yeah. doing low bar starting strength squats, you know, rarely is the case that they can perform three sets of five of low bar squats correctly without some idiot coming up to them in the gym and telling them they're doing it wrong. When Cherney and I have trained at a public gym, we were in linear progression, so we weren't terribly strong then. But I guarantee you, if we went now, there wouldn't be a single guy at a average gold's gym that squats more than Charity. Well, I use this all the time with my online coaching clients with Rachel. Guys, you can verbally abuse men typically a little bit easier than you can do. If you force a man to compare himself to somebody else, he tends to rise to the occasion. Not always, right? He tends to rise to the occasion. Females, and this is a blanketed, bigoted statement. I I totally understand. Please don't email me. This is from my experiences, 23 years as a coach. They're already comparing themselves to everybody. So you don't need to, right? Like I've noticed, I coach both Charity and my wife, Charity, your wife, and my wife, both of whom are very strong middle-aged females. But if I force them to compare themselves to each other, they're going to get, they get pissed at me. Right. However, if I compare my wife to one of my male clients to the male client. So if I have a male client who deadlifts 315 for the first time for a set of five, I say, man, awesome. You're only 20 pounds off my wife's best deadlift for a set of five. <laughs> right. And guess what he does? <laughs> he gets over right. 335 for a set of five, right? Or the first time. So she's got a deadlift of 402 at, at 40 years old and a couple C-sections. And she's a soccer mom who just doesn't even care about this that much. She doesn't take it super serious. She just lifts real consistent. And so when you get a 40-year-old guy who's struggling with a, you know, a 175-pound squat, and you go, look, my wife squats 355 he tends to pull his britches up and put his big boy pants on pretty quick and stop complaining about his 175 squat. So, which brings us to question number three. Are you eating enough? Probably the most important question is when we start to look at the stress recovery adaptation cycle, because we have tested decades and decades and tens of thousands of people on this program, we know that the stress is appropriate to drive the strength the change in homeostasis needed, the disruption in homeostasis needed in order to get the strength adaptation, as long as rest is enough. Stress, recovery, adaptation. The recovery has to be there, which means as a coach, I can control the stress, but I can't control the recovery very well. I don't have a handle on that, right? That's communication between me and the client. And so when the client 
needs to recover, I have to make sure, are they sleeping enough at night? Are they eating enough during the day? And not only that, I actually look at additional stressors in their life as a part of the thing that steals from recovery, right? So is there stress in their marriage? Is there stress in their job? Are there stress with their kids? Are there financial stresses going on? And that requires a pretty intimate level of conversation between me and my client. I can't have a client that is on the verge of divorce and won't tell me that they're on the verge of divorce because it affects their training enough, right? So are they getting seven, eight hours of sleep at night? If they're not getting seven or eight hours of sleep at night, are they able to take a nap during the day? That's a big thing for me. If somebody's like, hey, I'm only getting five or six hours of sleep at night, I go, look, I, you got to get an hour nap every right. day. And I want the hour nap before they train. Typically, right. I want you to sleep and then get up, eat your pre-workout, get to the gym and train. Are they eating enough? In general, if a guy is eating 225 to 250 grams of protein a day, that's pretty much what you need. How often do you prescribe a guy less than 225 grams of protein uh, uh, or more than 250? Yeah, uh, unless he was often. a very small guy. Like if you had a five, I mean, I'm not even being funny here. If you had a guy that was 5'2 and weighed 125, I probably wouldn't put him on 225 Yeah, sure, grams it's of probably protein. not enough, especially if he's under eating already, Yeah, right? So we can just titrate that up as well. And, and those guys exist and we train them and that's fine. But, but Yeah, and they're gonna need 220 grams of protein three months from now, yep. three and a half months yep. from now, but they don't need it in month one. And females, what we find, same sort of thing there is if they're eating 140 to 150 grams of protein, that's solid. It's that's pretty good. Mean. Most females, when they come in, they're eating 47. Yep, that's right. They're eating just under 50 grams of protein. And they'll say, no, I eat meat at every meal. Okay, look, you cut a chicken breakfast in half, you had half of it for lunch, and you had the rest of it for dinner. Right. You know, and if you actually log your food, you're going to find out that these ladies are eating 45, 50, yeah, it's very maybe little. 60. It's easy to take our stance and then, you know, make a straw man out of it. Look. We're talking about 220 to 250 grams of protein. 250 grams of protein is 1,000 calories. That's right. It's not that much. That's not a lot of food. Sure. Okay. And then we want you to get some carbs. We want you to get some fat. We're going to put you, I'm not going to put you on GoMad, even though if actually, if you were compliant, I would. Sure. Because you're a younger guy and you can tolerate it and you're tall and you're skinny. Sure. But, you know, we put some carbs and some fat in there. We're going to get you at 2,800 calories or something like that. It's more food than you've ever eaten, but you're by no means eating like a sumo wrestler. Yeah. You know, this is not like uh, Mr. Creosote, Monty Python levels of gorging yep. here, what we're talking about. We're talking about eating in an appropriate way for a strength athlete. And the first time you go, no, I'm not going to say the first time. The second time you go in and train linear progression, you're a strength athlete. Sure. That's it. And you have to eat like one. And yep. if you don't, you're just open yourself up for heartache and failure. Yeah, it's hard. It's hard. And I'm eating, and eating well, the recovery is as much of a piece of the stress recovery adaptation cycle as the stress is. And so we push on the stress and then we forget to push on the recovery. And I think people tend to take this recovery, just like you said, too far. They go, well, it makes people fat. It's go mad. And listen, like we're all running business, right? Yeah. We've got over 500 clients and we wouldn't have a low churn rate if everybody that hired us, we made them fat. Right. What we do is every week you take your body weight, you take your waist measurement if you're a guy. If you're a female, you might take bust, waist, hips, right? Three measurements. And we monitor the weight increase and we monitor the waist. And so if the waist is growing too fast and the weight is going up, but the waist is also going up a lot, back off the calories. Right. I really look at three criteria. One, are they hitting their numbers? Two, if they're underweight, are they slowly gaining? Are they slowly gaining weight? And is their waist staying the same or very slowly going up? Right. So underweight people both men and women, hypothetically, a five foot 10, 145 pound, 20 year old man yeah. starts on linear progression. And we, I would put that guy on go mad. Yeah. I'd have him drink a gallon of milk. If he's young, it's yep. full of all kinds of hormones that make beef cattle get giant. And I want him to benefit from that same stuff, but his waist is going to go up and here's why it's going to go up. It's not because he's getting hog fat. It's right. because he has zero muscle mass That's around right. his spine. No spinal erectors, right. barely has any abdominal muscles, sure. anything like abdominal that. Abdominal wall, obliques, erectors make your waist circumference go up. Yeah. So for these guys that have this body dysmorphia and are afraid of getting fat, I also have them buy the little kit off Amazon where they can do the little body fat pinch thing and sure. have them pinch right there through the waist. And yep. I'm going to be like, you're going to put two inches on your waist but it's because your back your is skin cal Your skin caliber number is not going up, or That's if it right. does, it's going to be minute. That's right. Super small. Yeah, yeah, great. And, and one other thing, even if we have an obese person that starts training and starts the linear progression, often their weight will actually go up for the first couple of weeks. Yeah. So, like, for example, let's just say a hypothetical 300-pound male 
will often gain, you know, five, pounds, five maybe seven, even 10 pounds yeah. in the first two or three weeks. But that guy's waist is going down. Yep. He's putting on muscle mass and he's devouring that fat in order, his body sure. fat in order to make that muscle mass. Sure. So we have to be rational people and not just think about one thing like body weight. You have to, you have to think about the whole picture. We yeah, have of to course. eat like, like athletes. You know, if you're six foot tall and you weigh 154, you don't lift barbells and you work at a desk, that's probably, that's probably an appropriate body weight for you. Sure. And whatever you're eating to maintain that, that's appropriate. But the minute you go, the second time, the first time you go, you're trying it out. The second time, you're a strength athlete. Yeah. You got to eat something different. You're not a computer jockey anymore. You're a strength athlete. Yeah, you're eating for performance. It's the same reason that we train, right? We train whether we feel good or not. That's the difference between training and exercise. We exercise to make ourselves feel good today, to yeah. get hot and sweaty today. We train regardless of how we feel. Oh, my God. We so, eat for the same purpose. It doesn't matter whether you're hungry. It doesn't matter whether you want ice cream or pizza or whatever. We eat for performance. So we make sure that the protein needs are there first. And of course, some of this depends on whether you're underweight or overweight. Right. If you're overweight, you eat for performance, which is you eat your protein every single day and you limit your carbs and fat because you have plenty of energy needs stuck on the sides of your ass. It, you do to drive your squat up. And if you're a 135 pound, six foot tall guy, you don't. And so you have to make sure that your energy needs are there, right? I mean, look, the reality is that most people don't need five, like even underweight guys don't need 5,000 calories no. a day. You titrate up to that number. It would be stupid if you're already eating 2,000 calories a day and you're underweight to jump immediately to 5,000 calories a day. You can jump to 2,400 calories a day and probably make progress for a month. And then when the progress slows down, you jump up another 100 calories per week. That's what most of us do, 100 calories per day per week, right? So instead of 2,400 calories a day, we go to 25 and we do that until it doesn't work. And then we go to 26 and we do that until it doesn't work. And then we go to 27 and we do the same thing with people losing weight. When people lose weight, maybe they're eating 3,500 calories a day to start and we put them on 3,300 calories. And what's amazing is if we change their macronutrient profile and we put them on, make sure they're eating enough protein and then just enough just enough carbs and fat to fill their calories, they'll probably actually lose weight at 3,300 calories. If yeah. they've been eating 37 or 38. No, look, lose fat. Lose fat. Yeah, probably, maybe not weight. Yeah, right. And after the first couple of weeks, it'll be some weight as well, right? And then when that stops working, they plateau. We drop their carbs and fat a little bit more, but we pretty much keep protein the same. So it's weird. You need to gain muscle or you need to lose fat. The protein needs in general are pretty well set, yeah. right? They're pretty well in that 225 to 250 for guys and pretty well in that sort of 140 to 150 for women. And of course, there's a little bit of variance there, but the top end of that bell curve, the high point of that bell curve is wide. And for 90% of the people out there, like those protein numbers will work. And then we just manipulate carbs yeah. and fat to get the desired effect. Yeah. Nobody got fat eating too much protein. It never happened. No. Right. Like it, it can happen in the laboratory, but it didn't happen in real life. Yeah. So I need some help, by the way. I've got a paper that I've been like, that's been on the back burner. I need somebody out there to help me find the numbers that will tell me what the calorie and uh, nutrient requirements are to synthesize a pound of muscle. Like I know that people are now cloning and uh, growing muscle cells in Petri dishes. So how many calories it takes? Yeah, what are the nutritional requirements to synthesize to build a pound of muscle pound or, of muscle. or any given quantity? I don't right. care. But you know, we know what those numbers are for fat and we know what they are for some other tissues, but I have not been able to find it for muscle. Apocryphally, it's about 5,000 calories to build a pound of muscle. But, you know, to find it in the literature and actually prove that, I have not been able to find that. Sure. But we do know that it takes about 3,500 surplus calories to make a pound of fat. Right. And we do know that it takes more calories to make the muscle than the fat. Sure. But Makes we're sense. kind of getting into body image stuff. And yeah, so the weight question, loss stuff, But we're really trying to recover so we can pick up substantially heavier weights every time. Right. So a quick review. We've got to make sure that our recovery is enough between sets. We have to make sure that we're making small enough jumps on the weights. And we have to make sure that our rest and our food are adequate to drive the recovery needed to complete the stress recovery adaptation cycle. Those, those are all important. There are other things, by the way, other things on this recovery cycle that I think are important just to note that I also think that we kind of poo-poo on. Those are the things that actually make us feel better, but aren't proven to aid in the recovery process. And I do think they're important because I think if they make you feel better, it's important. So things like for me, I'll tell you one of the things I do when I read. It chills me out and it mm. helps me recover. I like to read, yeah. right? And I actually, it's like, it's very, now there are certain things that I read that don't, right? If I read a big business book that gets my right. brain going and I'm taking notes and stuff, that's not it. I've been reading Lonesome Dove lately. Yeah, it's, it's, good. A, good, it's a great book, right? And it's and it relaxes me and it chills. If I'm sitting down and I'm working through the Iliad, that does not relax me. No. It's hard. It it's just hard. makes you so unhappy with the current <laughs> yeah, situation right. in the world. Yeah, sure. 
And nothing will piss you off. Yeah, and then the we, we do the things like, look, I, I do Epsom salt baths, and I've got a pool, and I've got a hot tub, you know, whatever, whatever floats your boat. Uh, those things I think are important because they make you feel better, not because they necessarily have been proven to aid in recovery. But a lot of times for me, if you are wired like I am to just be kind of overstimulated and run, 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 and go, 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 I have to do a lot of things in my life to kind of chill me out. It's a wonderful thing. Uh, you know, I think that if you cut yourself an ounce and a half of some old gritty cheese, that'd go a long way towards that too. You know, it's just, you can almost meditate on it. Like yeah. you put in your, you, you take a sip of it and you can just like focus on yeah. that. Yeah. By the way, I, I'm going to share with you after a while about four of the top end goat cheeses, local goat <laughs> cheeses, all different types of goat cheese. And they're on all different levels of stank. <laughs> you know? Stank, you're the better. Well, yeah, me too. They're so good. But uh, I mean, you know, some of them are real creamy and brie-like and some of them are like hard as rock and salt crystal, uh -huh. both, both delicious. You know, it's good. So uh, there is a fourth question. Well, I want to go back to the stressors. Okay. I, I want to tell a story. Sure. So I don't know when it was, probably three weeks ago, Charity and I had to put our friend Watson the cat to sleep. We got him right after we got married. He was 19 cry on years old. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. And, you know, we loved the guy. He was doing very, very well. Up you said he was 19? Last, he was 19 years God, old. That's old for a cat. Yeah. And he was, he was enjoying himself and doing well for the up until just like, you know, three or four days before, and then he wasn't able to do the things he liked to do, you yeah. know, and um, arthritis, and it was the right thing to do, and it was time, and so we took him to the vet, and we loved him very much, and we had to put the guy to sleep. And then we went home, and we had to train. Eesh. It's... Did you do it? Uh, we did, you know, we did at it. That's yeah. what my grandmother would say. We did yeah. at it. You know, we had, uh, I don't even remember what was programmed. I don't know. But you know, it was a struggle, wasn't it? Oh, it was, just, it was horrible. Yeah. It was absolutely horrible. Of course. But it kind of got us out of that, though, too, right? You know, we didn't have to, like, sit in a chair and just focus on, yeah. you know, what had happened that day. So that much is good. But, you know, it was not a great training day. Yeah. It was not a great training day. And so these things, you know, car wrecks, breakups, pet deaths, so on, they affect the training. Oh, and you've incredibly. got to take them in, you, you know, argument with uh, somebody at work. All that stuff uh, has a real effect that has to be considered when we're looking at our training, especially when you get to be working on the margins of your ability, which yep. you will be as a late linear progression person and intermediate. Yep. At the end, for sure. We miss Watson. I'll put him in the, I'll put a picture of Watson. In we the lost, uh, we lost our 16 year old cat. Same thing. We've got a cat three months into our marriage. Scotch, Scotchy, we called him butterscotch, but I called him Scotch, obviously like it's, right. I'm naming him after whiskey. And we I lost, like better we lost, too, though. Yeah, it's true. I lost him. Uh, we lost him about two years ago. I am not a sorry for all you pet lovers out there. I'm not a big pet guy. I'm not a huge animal guy. My wife and girls are huge animal people, and uh, I just I just spontaneously broke out in sobs for about horrible. two weeks after this. Yeah. And I think a part of it is for me, for you as well. It's like what the cat has seen. It's like that cat has been has watched my marriage struggle and then flourish it's watched the birth of my kids it's watched the and that's the struggle for us right like even i don't you have no idea how much consciousness the cat actually has and understands that's the painful part is like that cat has been there through all of it yeah. uh it watched us eat bologna sandwiches because we couldn't afford anything yeah. else it watched us go put two dollars of gas in our car it's so it's been through the whole thing and then you lose it and like oh my god that's the last 16 years of my life, like the cat just sat on the windowsill and watched <laughs> what happened to my family. And I think that's the thing that crushes us. Yeah, Watson. He's named after James Watson, by, yeah. by the way. And then his sister, we also had her put her to sleep last year. She was Francis. So she's like Francis Crick. Yeah. Was discovered to nice. Him. And, uh, you know, he'd been with us our entire marriage. You know, he's like the first crew. Like yeah. He'd been with us our entire marriage. And he, he and his sister made my house a home. Yeah. Yeah, cool. Yeah. So before we wrap this up, there is a fourth question is that is important, question. especially for middle-aged and older men. Yeah. And what is that question? Have you had your testosterone levels checked? Testosterone. Your testosterone. Yeah, it's really important. Yeah, you know, there are studies out there, and maybe I'll research them if it's some in the show notes, maybe not, depends on how lazy I am, that show that testosterone levels are, are just dropping in the West, and we need them. Uh, we need testosterone and women do too you know they need progesterone estrogen and some testosterone to recover properly so women should get that stuff checked as well especially if they're you know 35 or older and having trouble recovering but for men i think 40 and over and they're having trouble recovering they need to check so i was just tired as hell having double vision trouble concentrating when i read not terribly interested in work 
sex et drive, et cetera, et cetera. Well, that's always been pretty good. No, it hasn't. I've never slept well. Okay. Never slept well my entire life. But if you see pictures of me when I was a teenager, I wasn't terribly high testosterone then either. So I went and um, went and got it checked. And um, of course, you go in and you talk to the guy, the doctor, and then you go get your blood tested and then you come back. And it's like a three week deal. Sure. Just get a simple answer. Sure, sure. And I went in and he says, uh, you've got testosterone of an eight year old. <laughs> of an eight year old? <laughs> yeah. like a Of pre- an eight year old kitty cat. <laughs> I think I was. Um, like 239 39 years old yeah no it was 180 oh my god yeah it was literally an eight year old one doctors i know uh, i know <laughs> i'm familiar with standard testosterone what is that 180 micrograms per deciliter I think Na- so, is it nanograms is it nanograms no, nanograms per deciliter. Yeah, yeah you know it needs to be eight to 1200 you know the doctors yeah. would argue with me like, anything over 400 is normal i had a guy that got tested at 311 or 312 the other day at eight, eight like a 28 year old guy and the doctor's like you're low normal you're fine i said go get a different doctor when you go get a a blood test for anything red blood cell count anything you'll get the lab back you guys have probably all seen it sometimes they'll have a bar graph on there or sometimes they just have a number and it'll tell you high low medium whatever and that number is not a clinical level it's the statistical it's where you fall statistically within their testing cohort at that lab right well who do you think gets their testosterone check old people sure so if you're like in the normal range yeah. for 450 for to, that lab yeah. you're, you're still just low. right in the middle of all the old bastards that went in that's right because they had the skin tears and they fell down the stairs or sure it wasn't too long ago it was late summer here 2017 the centers for disease control lowered their clinical levels for testosterone to around 300 i can't remember exactly what it is as being average as being normal 300 it's to, not no it's it's not you know, studies show that it was enormously higher in the 80s and previous. Yeah. You know, uh, the average guy walks around here now with much, much lower testosterone than his granddad did yeah. at, his, at that age. Yeah. After I got on testosterone replacement therapy, I just felt normal again. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't, there's no rage or anything like that, but I was able to engage in difficult work, difficult reading material recovered better i just felt normal again i don't yeah. feel any there's i'm not like extra handbrake yeah let I us feel normal i think we should be clear we're not talking about performance enhancing drugs here if you want to take super physiological levels you want to take a gram a thousand milligrams of testosterone a week get the f out you're listening to the wrong podcast that's not who we're talking about we're talking about hormone replacement therapy we're talking about those of you who have testosterone that is menopause you're in menopause that's right Men who have testosterone that is far too low need to bring up their testosterone to where it is actually normal, which is probably somewhere in the 800 range would be, you know, ballpark area. 1200 looks awesome, (laughs) a little better, but 400 is too low. Yeah, you have X number of receptors for the testosterone, right? And if you, you know, supersaturate your blood with it, it doesn't really do anything for you anyway. You could take, you know, five grams a week and, you know, it wouldn't give you much of an enhancing effect anyway. But we're just trying to be normal, you know. And so ladies um, have known about menopause and there have been replacement therapies for them and it's been widely accepted and understood in the medical community for for decades. decades. Decades and decades. And meanwhile, you know, your dad sits in a chair and watches TV and everybody says, you know, Dad sure has mellowed out as he aged. He's wore out. Yeah. And his hormone levels are in the basement. Right. He, he gets a cut on his hand mowing the yard. He can't heal. Right. Like the, Bleeds. These guys, yeah, these guys, He's their, got, their hormone levels are terrible. Right. Well, and I mean, a big piece of this too is that it comes down to quality of life, right? Dr. Sullivan talks about this, what barbell training does, and certainly normal levels of testosterone play into this, is that I want to have an incredible quality of life right to the end, and then I want to die. Boom. Dead. What I don't want to do is have a decline of quality of life yeah. and they die. And if, if you could go to most people at 50 and say, hey, the quality of your life is going to depreciate significantly over the next 30 years. Yeah, you're, you're at peak Reynolds. You're 50. This is the Reynolds. best it gets. And it's all downhill from here. A lot, most of us would choose to die <laughs> earlier. Maybe. But if there was an answer that said, hey, instead, what you can do is you can keep the quality of your life better and better and better and then just drop dead of your heart will stop or you have a car accident or whatever at 80 i want that right, right. or whatever I, my friend doug used to say that he wanted to die like wrestling a bear or because his gun hung in the holster that's how he wanted to go because <laughs> his gun hung in the holster huh, yeah doing an old-fashioned shootout yeah <laughs> perfect yeah so those are the questions so when we come to the end of linear progression we have to ask primarily is recovery enough are we recovering enough between sets like acutely are we recovering long enough from a systemic sort of sleep between session period? 
are we eating enough primarily are we eating enough protein and then uh, are we making small enough jumps and is our testosterone are our testosterone levels adequate for us yeah and to be fair you know you ladies you know uh, are your are your levels appropriate as well yeah yeah we've started to see some hormone replacement therapy for women of testosterone like 25 milligrams a week, things like that to bring yeah, 20, their 25 is yes, a pretty normal there. dose for them. Uh, same sort of thing. And if you're old enough, if you're an old enough female, you will need that actually. But the reason we bring up the men first is because like we said earlier, hormone replacement therapy for ladies is much more widely understood by the medical community and even the lay people. And it's really in kind of an in infancy for guys. Yeah. Uh, we beat the hell out of this. Yeah. Let's wrap it up. So thanks for listening to Barbell Logic. We'd love to have your reviews. If you love the podcast, we'd love to have reviews on iTunes. I think you can leave reviews on Stitcher. You can also leave reviews on Facebook for us. Yep. Any of those would be great. Yeah, and we need you guys to spread the word. Thanks so much. Yeah.